The Razor's Edge Show. If the truth hurts, prepare for pain. You're listening to Critical Mass Radio. Now it's our turn. Blimey. Hey. <laughs> Been away for God knows how long. Uh, I finally get back, you know, to do uh, the the Razor's Edge Show, which, you know, is now once in a blue moon. And things just go tits up. I don't know. Uh, but gremlins you know seem to have settled down calmed down a bit um probably lost a bit of the audience that uh, george had fantastic show i could have listened to that never mind me my load of nonsense i could, I could have sat listening to that all night fantastic tell you what with them scousers eh? just when you think you've got the measure and they come back and bite you on the ass don't they you know no prep whatsoever comes up with a show like that, which will go down in the annals of history of Critical Mass Radio as probably one of the best. Still, here I am, back. Um, loads has happened, hasn't it, since um, you last heard me uh, swearing and carrying on. Um, sad news. Uh, we lost one of our rank and file, Paul Hickson. Um, a friend of mine, known him a couple of years. Um, that's the thing with the truth movement, though, isn't it? We've we've all not known each other that long, because um, we've all come to this from different areas, haven't we? Different uh, walks of life, and we've found new friends, haven't we? In the last sort of eighteen months, two years, I've known Paul about um, eighteen months, two years, and over the last year, got to know him really well. You know, became a good friend, and um, yeah, he took his own life a couple of weeks ago, and. We were all shocked because, to be frank, we didn't see it coming. I didn't see it coming. He, he used to suffer from um, a bit of depression and migraines. He used to have really, he used to get really bad migraines. But um, proper cheeky chap, really intelligent, fiercely intelligent, one of the most intelligent people I've ever known. And that may that may well have been his downfall, to be honest, because. He studied, he deconstructed this whole matrix system. He knew the ins and outs of a cat's ass when it came to false flag terror. He could tell you dates, times, names, places, straight off the top of his of his head, straight off the cuff. And a really sad loss because I've never known a fellow with as much potential that wasn't realised. And I'm not just talking about in the truth movement, just in general life. He's the sort of chap, um, if he didn't have his problems... Um, it could have reached the top of whatever sort of profession he'd have gone into. You know, when you meet people like that and you think they're wasted. You know, they could be have been so much more, and uh, and it could have been a real asset to us if he didn't carry that little bit of baggage he had. So it was really, really sad to lose that fella. And um, yeah, it is sad, but I also I think death is a release from this. So in a way. I was glad for him because he'll be in a better place. Because to me, this is hell. You know, this is um, this isn't how we're supposed to be living. Not by a long chalk. And Paul knew that, and I think that's what got to him in the end. He just had enough. He'd had enough. He hated people. He hated the general public. You know, when we were chatting and everything, he just had nothing but contempt for him. You know, we sort of put up with him, don't we? We, you know, some of us are like, I, I don't bother anymore. To be honest, I don't try converting people I don't you know I, I put the information out there I do my bit you know but people in an age of information you know ignorance is a career choice for me the information's out there if you've not got that wit and intelligence and anything about you to take take up that cudgel when it's there you know then to me you, I'm not wasting my breath on you I'm not wasting my time and energy um I think that's what got to Paul in the end. He just sort of had had enough and he couldn't see the point, to be frank. Um, and I can sympathise with those you know, views, but I still think there's light at the end of the tunnel. I wouldn't do this if I didn't think the end result would be you know, eventual success for us, the people, against this power elite that have controlled us for millennia. And uh, in terms of colours and reduce our number to a manageable level that can service them and their um, immortality, because uh, that's what their end game is, isn't it? Yeah, very sad, but we won't um, won't brood on that. Perhaps I've I've got something for Paul later on in the show. 
yeah, but absolutely loads has been happening. Loads is coming up. We've got the conference, haven't we? Um, a week Saturday, uh, the first Critical Mass Radio conference, which is looking uh, brilliant. You know, the the work that's going into it, you know, by people like uh, Paul and, and Lisa, Lisa especially. She's been doing some great stuff. She wants a, a good pat on the back. Um, Dark Horse, that one, you know, Hidden Talents. Uh, great at desktop, publi desktop publishing, um, proofreading, all that sort of thing. Fantastic. Hide the light under a bushel for me. Um, yeah, we've got some good people coming together. Really have. And, um, you know, this is going to be our first conference, isn't it, where the truth movement rears its ugly head in the Manchester area. And uh, we're going to try and get as many people there as possible. But don't be too disappointed, you know, if we don't get a massive turnout because uh, we're dealing with sheeple, aren't we? But we'll do our best. And that's all we can do. And our conscience is salved then, isn't it? When you do your best. That's all you can do. And if people don't... Uh, you know, latch on to the message we're trying to give them. That's hardly ha our fault, is it? It's their fault. And that they'll deserve everything that's coming to them, won't they? When the uh, Illuminati comes to bite them on the ass, which it will do eventually. Right, um, yeah, loads, loads is happening. Um, I'm getting on my tits since we last spoke. As you well know, <laughs> things get on my tits. And, uh, you know, this is cathartic, isn't it? Because it um, gives me a chance to spout my bile and get it off my chest. Things that have been really annoying me. Um, Remembrance Day. Wasn't, that was... Um, I've not had any emails since, um, you know, the last set of shows. But um, when you become erratic, like the Razor's Edge show has become, I suppose that'll happen, won't it? Which, you know, I'm going to try and address that. Um, I'm going to try and get on a bit more. Lost it last week because of um, no broadband. And it turns out our cat, because I've got my um, modem, BT Infinity modem on top of this shelf um, in my computer room. I could call it my computer room, little box room. <laughs> the bunker, you know, um, where we formulate our plans. Yeah, and I've got it on a, a shelf, and uh, our cat, Chocolate, decided that, um, you know, he wants to sleep on this shelf, so we knocked the uh, modem off. And that was, because uh, it worked after that for a bit, but um, apparently when the uh, engineer had a look at it, he's boring the arse off you, innit? But when the engineer had a look at it, he said, uh, yeah, it was cat-related. So um, I gave him a clip round the ear and said, don't do that again. And it's a cat-free zone now. Um, the time being. Where are we here? <laughs> That's bollocks, innit? Remembrance Day. Yeah. Um, there was a time, you know, when um, I'd been to the odd Remembrance Day ceremony, you know, when I wasn't awakened, when I'd stand in front of a sanitaph or an obelisk, you know, the Illuminati rubbing it in our faces. You know, we create these wars. We cull you. We give you these endless brothers wars, murdering each other for our profit, for population control, you know, for the arms industry, for our imperialism to rape other nations' resources, and slaughter and rape their women and children. And I'd stand in front of a cenotaph or an obelisk like a dick, remembering, you know, people that had given their lives for this uh, nonsense. Woke up since, won't do it now. You know, I don't see anything, you know, that's what you're saying, it? glorious wars. You know, the first and second world wars were glorious wars. What's glorious? In the deaths and, you know, disfigurement of our finest, our youngest men and women, killed, maimed, wounded in, in, in this needless bloodbath. You know, on the fields of the Somme and Passchendaele and whatever, where we just, a whole, our whole generations were wiped out by these murdering swine, these murdering bastards. I don't see anything glorious in that. You know, the only time, the only time we could ever be asked as a, a people of a nation to fight is when your nation's being under attack. And it is under attack. All nations are under attack. All peoples are under attack. All cultures are under attack by these bastards. And that's who we should be taking up arms against and fighting. I don't mean that in a literal sense. I don't mean, you know, finding weaponry and um, submachine guns and hiding them in bin bags and burying them in the park till the time arrives. I'm not on about that. I'm on about formulating their end. That's fighting them, you know. Working to bring them down, working to get the information, working to wake up our brothers and sisters before the next Third World War comes, for the for the next mass culling. You know, we've got to face facts, haven't we? Hey, you know, British youth, young soldiers dying today, in Afghanistan, you know, Iraq, Syria and Iran next, in these illegal wars. But 
you know, yeah, I do feel sorry for them. I do feel sorry for the families, but they they, they are no better than mercenaries. I've said this before, but that's what they are. They're mercenaries. And they've got to be prepared to pay the ultimate price for the wages they get, for the 250 quid they get a week, 300 quid a week. You know, wages from the Illuminati Zionist masters. You know, when you read, when when you see it on the television or you get the paper, you see that, you know, murder and soldiers have been killed in places like Afghanistan and Iraq. Don't, you know, don't waste your compassion or your grief. They died as mercenaries. I hate that saying with you. He died doing the job he loved. Why would you love doing that job? I've done it myself eight years. It wasn't it was a different kettle of fish, obviously, then. But why would you love doing that? Why would you love going into a country like Iraq and terrorising young children, murdering them and bombing the, their homes and raping those nations? Why would you enjoy, enjoy doing that job? What camaraderie could you get from that? I don't know. I give up. You know, we stand there, don't we? On the, well, we don't on them, I don't anymore, but the, the, the sheep all on the 11th of November and all these corrupt, bent politicians that send them there in the first place, they stand there, don't they? And the bloodlines stand there in front of the cenotaph in Whitehall, the Queen and her murdering ilk. How they've got the front, we know, but the, the reality is what they're doing, it, they're recognising that we did this. It's not remembering the fallen to them. It's like a celebration. I think Ben made the point on his show last night, which I listened to on podcast. He made the point that there is video somewhere knocking about where the Queen is actually dancing at the cenotaph. When poppies are falling from the sky or something, she's having a bit of a dance. She'll dance when I get older, but I tell you, bastard. <sighs> You know, it's, that, that, but the thing is, you know, I'm proud that I do the job I love. But you just have to look at the papers, what's been happening to normal squaddies that have been doing this for donkey's years, that have been coming up to retirement. They're sacked weeks before they get a pension. So they don't have to be paid out a pension. They find some excuse to sack them. Or they throw, or they throw squaddies in jail because they might take a souvenir or something. That's always happened. First of all, well, squ you know, squaddies used to take care of it. Off, uh, it's a bit, you know... It's not, you can't condone it really, but you'd squad you to take a souvenir off a, a dead German or a dead Japanese. You know, in, in the war, they'd take a lighter or something or a, a helmet or something. It was a souvenir, wasn't it? You know, something to put on the mantelpiece when you go home. Apparently, squaddies have been doing that and they've been getting put in jail and sacked for it, you know, because they took a berry off a, an Iraqi or an Afghanist, Afghanistani. Appalling, yes, but that's just the culture, isn't it? That's just the way they do. That's the way squaddies have always behaved. Doing the job you love. They don't want to pay benefits to soldiers that have had their limbs blown off. Oh no, it's part of your job. You knew what you were doing when you signed up. So you lose a leg, you don't get any benefits for it. At the minute, there's families in there going into court to get compensation off these murdering bastards when they when they lose a, a loved one who's become a mercenary for their British Corporation or the American PLC. Unbelievable. Freedom fighters. And that's how they describe that's how some, you know, describe Afghanis or Iraqis. Freedom fighters. There was a time I'd have scorned that no, they're not freedom fighters, you know. This is a war, you're not a freedom fighter. Of course it's their freedom fighters. They're fighting to stop their nations being raped and pillaged. They're the people we should have our sympathies with. You know, years ago I'd be condemned as some sort of bullshit communist or this sort of thing, wouldn't I? But, you know, far from it. You know, we're far from that. This is just reality. This is just how reality's played out, isn't it? Because we're waking up to the fact that armies don't exist, exist anymore. It's just... 
mercenaries for the new world order. There's not armies protecting people. They, when they when they, you join the army, you sign up to you know protect the nation, protect the queen. You know, I'm not down with that particularly. But it's about protecting the people, isn't it? About protecting the nation. Not going on some excursion into some nation to rape and pillage on behalf of these murdering bastards. You don't get any sympathy off me. I'm not standing in front of their senators and their obelisks for this. And if they've got anything about them, squaddies, especially the officers, the intelligent ones, they can't see through this. And they are intelligent, believe you me. British officers are intelligent people. Rank and file, it's just people who can't get another job. That's basically it. There's a few exceptions, obviously, you know. But by and large, most people that join the army now, it's because you can't get another job. But the officers, that's a different kettle of fish. They're intelligent people who, who you know, would normally excel in all walks of life. And they're leading our lions, you know, lions led by donkeys. They're leading the lions into wars for oil, for blood libel. It's just sickening. It really is sickening. <sighs> so... Yeah, I could go on, I could go on, but I've, got, I've gone on about this before. It just sickens me. It really, I just, the hypocrisy of it. And when I see them, Cameron and Clegg and Brown and Blair with their, you know, rings of poppies at the cenotaph, it just makes me piss. Yeah, that's right, Lisa. Uh, they might be the odd expletive. <laughs> I'm trying to keep them to a minimum, though. You know, I'm only using them um, to punctuate the odd sentence. You know, it's not a case of... Um, you know, just to get on your nerves. Anyway, I think um, that leads me on to, I always forget this bit, but I, I think I feel I always have to do it because, um, you know, we get new people listening, don't we, on their podcast, because uh, I like to podcast the ass of some of these shows, you know, uh, around the world so we get a big audience. Uh, so if anyone in the meantime wants to get in touch with me, send me some emails, which, uh, you know, I had a plethora of early doors, but uh, they've dried up a bit because of uh, me arsing about. You, know, you can get in touch with me at Razor's Edge at Critical Mass Radio dot co dot uk that's razor's edge at critical mass radio dot co dot uk so if anything i say annoys you get in touch you agree with anything get in touch anything you want to say get in touch you know any old bollocks talk about me you know me and my cat my missus uh you know how i ever go at her and all that it's funny that with my missus you know um i saw her the other day wearing one of those skirts you know where you can see just see the edge of her ass poking out i'd probably find it quite sexy if the skirt wasn't uh knee length you know but, um, yeah, I'll tell you what, please be aware that the views and opinions expressed on this show should not be taken as a representative of Critical Mass Radio or the other hosts who broadcast upon it. I believe that free speech is a fundamental freedom and not a privilege given to us from on high. I intend to express that freedom to its maximum. If you don't believe in free speech and expression, then switch off. If you believe that there should be parameters on freedom of speech, then switch off. But if you believe that free speech shouldn't be for everyone, off you fuck. But if, like me, you believe that everyone should have their say, no matter how distasteful, we find those views and opinions, and you've come to the right place, the Razor's Head Show. Um, yeah, we, we tell it like it is, don't we? Right, um, yeah, just to a quick point on, obviously, you know, I wasn't keen on Remembrance Day and the whole caboodle surrounding it, but um, things struck me. You know, where the, the latest demonisation is of Assad, isn't it, in Syria? You know, he's the new one, isn't he? Turning off incubators, being in babies, all the rest of the lies and manipulation. You know, these fake spring uprisings of, you know, made up of foreign mercenaries trying to overtake that nation. Um, 33,000 people killed in 19 months due to these bastards. And that's even before official wars declared. 33,000 people. But all the sad there issued a law on GM food the other week, as he put it to preserve human life. You know, his forces locked in bloody confrontation with armed rebels, you know, according to the uh, control media. He's approved a law on the health and security of ge genetically modified organisms to regulate their use and production. You know, he says, that, as I said, uh, the law is meant to preserve the health of human beings, animals, vegetables and the environment. So this is a sad, you know, this evil Hitlerite-like dictator. I don't see our governments doing that, do you? Then getting a GMO right down our necks, and you know, telling it's a good thing, pissing down our backs, telling us it's raining, you know. 
And this is um, an evil dictator doing this. You can see through the lies and the hype, can't we, people? But can the sheep, that's the thing, right? Um, things are getting hard, aren't they, financially? We're all feeling it. You know, never, I've got a pot to piss in. Never seem to have enough money to pay the bills or whatever. We've just got now, have we? Oh, we're all in the same boat, you know. But just uh, there was a thing launched at the TUC conference uh, the other week. Um, families now having to borrow, this is borrow, just to live, more than £325 a month just to make ends meet. Combination of soaring living costs, pay freezes. Just the pre everything, isn't it? Petrol going up, diesel going up. Food prices going up, everything. Having to borrow 325 quid a month. And where are they borrowing it from? You know, because all the main uh, facilities are being closed, aren't they, from the bank banksters? You know, overdrafts, all this, it's all going now. Easy credit, all gone out the window now. Low cost, you know, loans, all gone out the window. You know, so if you're borrowing now, you're just not, you're not going to be able to pay it off. So even though you you know you've you've got your monthly salary, your weekly wage or whatever, and that's just not paying for you know to live, you've got to borrow. You know, twenty two thousand people were surveyed, and the results showed that the average amount borrowed each month had risen over a six month period from one hundred and twenty seven pound eighty eight pence to three hundred and twenty seven pound eighty eight pence. A special concern is the finding that more than four million people regularly had to use payday lenders. See a thing on that wonga.com. Absolute loan sharks. You know, absolute disgusting. You know, you borrow 300 quid, you end up owing about 40 grand within a month. Unbelievable. And they've got adverts on the telly there with little puppets, haven't they? You know, oh, borrow a bit of money, you'll be all right. Just see you over. Tories, you know. <laughs> Smiling assassins, that's what I call them. Complete bastards. And they love all this because you see they're all in bed with each other, aren't they? You know, donate don't, Wonga apparently the top chairman of don't, they donates to the Tory party, so they're not going to say anything, are they? Labour they're all in the pockets anyway, so they won't be saying anything about all this. It's growth industry for them. If you've got people for working for Wonga in the call centres or whatever, they'll see that as a good thing, won't they? It's getting people off the unemployment figures, working for loan sharks. Unbelievable. Cameron, oh, I've got some stuff on him later on, but you see, I don't want to go on about him uh, too early, because I've got some stuff on him, but you saw the stuff with uh, Philip Schofield, didn't you? Hey, that, he's one of them, isn't he? Hey, think about the communicate. this new communications acts and laws are going through, aren't they? Everything we say on the internet now, everything we type, everything, you know, any form, Twitter, Facebook, anything, it's all going to be logged and all going to be kept and it's all going to be sifted through and used against us in the future. Do it! You listened to me last show, didn't you? Come on, you're a shower of paedophile bastards. And I've got more on you tonight. Go for it! Love it! I'd love to see the likes of Cliff Richard and the hairy cornflake and the rest of the Harriet Harman and the rest of these paedophile bastards. Come on down, we'd love it. We'd love our day in court with you. David Icke's been naming these for donkey's years. He'd never had the front to do anything about it. McAlpine and his ilk. McAl David Icke named McAlpine, was it 1998, The Biggest Secret? Named him as a paedophile. This this fella comes out now, yeah, he was, uh, you know, he was abusing me. Suddenly, oh, I've, I've, you know, oh, I've got the wrong fella. I say, yeah, I'd be well bought off. Hey, you give it a couple of weeks, you'll see him driving round in his new Range Rover. Unbelievable. Um, new contracts, hey, you see the thing about the... Um, well, selling your soul, basically, wasn't it? For money, offering uh, employers new contracts, making them owner employees, you know, of small businesses. So it's, well, it's designed to appeal to small businesses. What, in effect, it means is you give up all your rights, you know, all your working rights that people have fought, died for for donkey's years. You give them all up so that you become, you be give, you're given shares in the company you're in. You know, <laughs> When has that ever worked? Oh, it's what we're creating, cooperatives. I don't think so. It's just another scam, isn't it? Remember the old, um, when they sold off all our utilities in this country? Sold off the gas, sold off the electric. Oh, we're putting it in the hands of the people. 
you know, we're taking it out of the, the national good, of the family silver, all the utilities, and we're, you know, people can buy shares in it, but you become big. How many people have still got them shares? How many people have still got shares in British Telecom and gas and the electric and the water? How many hundred people have still got them shares that they didn't sell off years ago when they were skint? And now it's just the co foreign corporations that about own them. Milking us dry. So now they're asking workers to give up all their rights, sick benefits, maternity pay. Give it all up and you can have a couple of shares in the company. You watch. As soon as they do all that, give them six months they'll all be sacked. Because you've given up your rights. Your Burks. And people will take it up, won't they? Oh, I wouldn't mind being, you know, a co-owner of my company. The boss might stop slapping me on the head then, slapping around the back of the head. You know, unfair dismissal, out the window. Won't be a claim for it once you give up this right. This is the Tories again, isn't it? You know, people have got short memories, people, about this, this country especially. Short memories, how we've been treated in the past. Working people. In mines, in pits, in the mills. Hey, how we were treated. It always pisses me off. It always pisses me off when you know you you get apologists for um, things like mass immigration or whatever, and they'll say, yeah, but we we exploited other nations, didn't we? So if things have you know if people come here and you know take advantage of the nation now, you know we can't blame them. We were to blame for expl no, we fucking weren't to blame. Ordinary working people were to blame for what the, the bloodlines did and what the imperialists did, what the empire builders did. We were exploited just as much in the past. You know, when Britain had the empire, sun that never set, kids still in mills, in mines, you know, working in mines 16 hours a day in the pitch black with a donkey and a fucking candle or a canary in a cage, people get all this for fuck all. I mentioned it in the past, and I keep, keep having to reiterate things, but it's true, you know, like in the First World War when they didn't have to bring in conscription because men wanted to go and fight to get so they could have three square meals a day. But most of them were turned away because they were full of malnutrition, they had rickets. That's how the working class were. That's what they want to return us back to before the mass call begins. No rights, no, none of their privileges that they throw, none of the crumbs from the table, we just become serfs again. Wake up, you shower of bastards. No wonder Paul got sick here, I tell you. Any idiot that goes along with this, you deserve everything you get. Absolutely everything you get. God, they piss me off. Right, um, I've got to lighten this up a bit, haven't I? I can't have this all night, can we? Um, hey, this is for Philip's gone there. Uh, Philip, who's a. Uh, runs the Critical Mass Radio YouTube channel and puts the videos up, etc. He uh, likes all that country uh, folk singing and stuff like that. Um, this is a weird song, this, because um, it's unique, because there's not many songs, is there, that you can think I've got in the British top ten that were uh, a cappello, and, in fact, this is the only one, a cappello and sung in Latin. Here we go. Yep, uh, well, it is the place to be, isn't it? Um, and it's getting better. Uh, I think I think the new look on the uh, criticalmassradio.co.uk website is uh, you know it's coming together, isn't it? You know there'll be a bit of teething problems early doors. Uh, when it all comes together, should be good. Uh, if you're listening uh, via blog talk or via podcast in the future, I suggest you check out criticalmassradio.co.uk where you can listen to shows live as opposed to retrospectively. Um, yeah, listen to swearing live. Listen to George the Scousers tomorrow. Listen to them live. <laughs> Home goal there, but I won't take it. But yeah, you can come and listen, can't you? And, uh, have a bit of fun. Um, yeah, and there's a chat facility there, yeah, which I've not mentioned, have I? Yeah, if you come to criticalmassradio.co.uk, there's a chat room there, and uh, you know, have a bit of fun, have a chat, comment on what the uh, hosts are saying and the guests are saying. I don't have guests on mine particularly. Couldn't fit them in, in amongst all this crap. But um, yeah, it's a good place to be. So you know, we're, we're building a community, we're building a family. Um, of like-minded people, we're going to support each other. We're going to network. We're going to build the, you know, the front against these bastards. Which in the past there has been people that have been fighting against this system, but they've been stuck in their paradigms and their left-right bollocks, and it's not worked, has it? And they've laughed at us and they've pulled the strings 
And, you know, we are the final vanguard, aren't we, of people that have rejected all that nonsense. So you can come to Critical Mass Radio and say what you bloody well like, as long as you believe it. And you can defend what you're saying. Don't nobody has to agree on everything. No, people listening to this show certainly won't agree with everything they hear. But, you know, it's uh, it's my freedom to say it. And everyone, every host on this station has that freedom to say what they want, you know, without censorship and without... Um, powers that be sticking their oar in well for now anyway um yeah it, it, another thing that uh, i've been following since we last spoke was um the way this system manipulates things that on the face of it seem you know quite reasonable you know nobody likes racism do they or hatred or you know discrimination against people purely because they're a different um race or religion or nationality it's negative and it's wrong isn't it we don't, we all have got a deep seated feeling you know that we believe in fair play we don't we that's all we believe in fair play everyone gets a fair crack of the whip level playing field and we're all happy aren't we all got a few quid in our pocket um we're happy we can feed our families keep a roof over our heads we're happy basically aren't we we're simple animals you know we don't all aspire to be these bloodlusting control freaks we just want to get on with each other and basically left to our own devices we do you know, there's obviously exceptions, but you'll get that in anything, won't you? But um, I just see the way these manipulators are working. That one struck me a few weeks back was um, a fellow called Michael Coleman, a BMP member from um, Stoke, that sort of neck of the woods, I believe. Um, did a blog, he's got a blog, and apparently on his blog he's been saying things, you know, that normal, uh, in inverted commas, civilised people find distasteful. Um, apparently he's been calling people, immigrants, darkies and such, and, you know, they shouldn't be here, and all the, you know, the, the stuff they come out with, but anyway, he's, um, it's a blog, and if you want to read what this Michael Coleman's got to say, obviously, you've got to go to his blog and read what he's got to say, if you don't want to hear what someone from the BMP is saying, or their ilk, then, frankly, you don't go, do you? If you're not a, if you're not a truth though, if you're not part of the truth movement, you know, or you're not part, you don't believe in false flag terror like we are change, or you don't believe in um, the sovereign movement like uh, Freedom Northwest and the way we're fighting back. If you don't believe in it, you don't come to Crystal Mass Radio, do you? And listen to what we've got to say. Or you might just pop along to listen what to what we've got to say and to say it's a load of bollocks, but leave it at that, you know. But this fella, Michael Coleman, a dick, but he's had things to say, and the powers that be have come on top, and he got an eight-month suspended sentence the stuff he'd written on his blog and uh, ordered to do 240 hours of community service. Well, that's a lot. That 240 hours is a lot for having something to say, isn't it? doesn't matter if you agree with what he's got, he's got to say or not. That's not right. Blimey, you can, get, you can mug an old granny in the street, make a purse, you'd get, you know, 100 hours or something. This fella's just had something to say on a blog. But the thing is, this is how they work, isn't it? Because most, like I say, most decent people would think, you know, well, you can't go around saying stuff like that. You know, so you've got to be sensitive for it. But it's part of the manipulation, isn't it? That you see that this whole thing now, the thing with John Terry there, the footballer, Chelsea in England. Um, well, he's, he's good up playing for England now, hasn't he? But um, he got found not guilty by a court of law, by a jury of, you know, his peers, found him not guilty for uh, apparently using a racial slur against um, Ferdinand. And yet the FA decided, no, you know, they might, they might have found you uh, innocent, but we've decided you're guilty. And he was banned, fined a, a lot of money, you know, nothing to him, probably half a week's wages. You know, but still a fat wad of cash and banned by the Football Association. <laughs> Since when did they become judge and jury? Since when, since, since when did these over, overlords at the Football Association, which is bread and circus anyway, remember people, what football is nowadays, Premiership football, bread and circus, but the people are watching it, aren't they? Everything that's on that back page or the front pages, they're taking in. And, and the underlying message is you cannot say anything that the zeitgeist or the you know zeitgeist of the times, spirit of the times says, you know, no, you can't say that sort of thing. You can't say it. But 
we've got to see the bigger picture here. Now, they, but by me talking about this, doesn't mean I'm saying that re all racist or racial opinions or anything like that, you know, you should be able to go around the street calling people names or whatever. That's not what I'm saying. The point is the powers that be are using this. They're laying the foundations. And I've seen it in the past. I know what their MO is. I remember it in the early 80s or late 70s, same sort of MO again, and they used the far right again. They, at the time, um, I don't know all the lot of you people were listening, but uh, at the time, late 70s, early 80s, the National Front and other groups like the British Movement, etc., used to hold marches up and down the country. The carnage, you know, in places like Lewisham and Manchester and Birmingham and all these, they'd have a march and they'd be, you know, fighting on the streets and everything. Thatcher, um, as a direct result of these far-right marches, etc., brought in the Public Order Act. And the rest of the political establishment all applauded it. The people, the, you know, civilised people all applauded it because, oh, we're putting a stop to, you know, these nasty Nazis. The first time it, the, the Public Order Act was enacted was against steel workers, was against, used against the miners, was used against the print workers, the, you know, the shipbuilders. That's who it was used against. It wasn't used against the National Front, but that's how this legislation came into place. And it's the same with these, these curbs on freedom of speech or these uh, actions against these nasty Nazis and these nasty racists. If we, if we set the, if we allow these pre precedents to be set, they just, it doesn't, isn't used against them. It will be used against the likes of us. And when they harbour on about this racist thing, you know, we can't have people saying anything that might be, you know, anti-religious or anti-racist or, and, you know, as a go at anyone, when we start talking about international Zionist bankers, this is the first legislation they'll use against us. You can't say that. The fact that it's true, the fact that <laughs> it's got nothing to do with it, is it? If it's the truth we're pointing out. Yeah, the Rothschilds and the Warburgs and the rest of them, they're right, they are Zionists. But this legislation, these precedents have already been set. The clampdown's already been there and we let it happen. Because we fell for their trick. <sighs> we can't see. We've got to rise above it, people. We've got to rise above all this, you know, PC crap. We all know what common decency is. We all know when someone's crossed the line. It's it's there for everyone. And I'm just, like I say, I just believe in a fair level playing field for everyone. And I hate these manipulators. There's a thing in Liverpool the other week, MOBO Awards, right? Music of Black Origin. Now, on the face of it, fair enough. Music that has come from a Black Origin. But what if, you know, some racist set up a, or people decided we'll have a music of White Origin? What would happen then? I wouldn't have thought without the manipulation of things, people wouldn't give a toss, you know, because they just see a level playing field. Well, people, black people have decided they want a award for people who, you know, who've created music who are from that um, genetic background, you know. Double standards, but those double standards are put there deliberately to create the division to have a go, a go, you know, people might not say it openly, but if you're, you know, if you're down with the working class or our working class like me, and you and you, you listen to pe what people are saying in pubs, etc., this is exactly the sort of statements they make. Music of black origin. What well, well, white music of white origin? And there's no real argument against it, is it? Because you know, if the Japanese added with what, uh, you know, music of Japanese origin, would that be racist? I don't think it would be. People of Arab descent do it. We're having music of, uh, you know, Arab Arab origin. Would that be racist? The, the, according to the zeitgeist, no, it wouldn't be. Double standards, double standards, and all it does is create friction and division, and gets a split up, doesn't it? And that's exactly what they want: divide and conquer. And I'm fed up to the back teeth of having, you know, the PC brigade and people even on our so-called wavelength who won't talk about this sort of thing because they're frightened oh well you know we don't want to be tarred with that brush do we fuck off Tarry me with any brush you bleeding like couldn't care less right <laughs> it's not lightening things up this is it i said i would but it's not happening right um say so what we'll have another quick song while i try and <laughs> lighten myself up uh hey this is another one of those um it's not strictly you know those uh songs that um 
a cover, covers that are better than the originals because this, as far as I know, was a song by Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark, but it wasn't released as a single. But everyone used to know it because anyone who bought the Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark, I think it was the first album, always thought well, this is one of their favourite tracks. But uh, I recently came about across this cover of it, and uh, those of you who like Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark will recognise the song. But I just think it's uh, you know better than the original, which uh, which is hard with Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark because they've got a really unique sound, haven't they? Which is hard to um, sort of replicate or better. I'll see what you think. <laughs> Don't get any better than that, does it? Eh? You want to get your get your inspiration from? Lie me, Jerry Sadovich. Yeah, um, yeah. But so that shows you, doesn't it? Someone like uh, him, uh, who knew what the score was, knew the the people who were even uh, procur- procuring uh, children for the establishment, as in Jimmy Savile, um, using you know the craze in early doors to procure children for the establishment and acting as protection. Should any a journalist get a bit uppity, or you know, someone might, or a journalist, you know, wants to expose what's going on, get a visit from the craze. Last thing you want, isn't it? You know, especially when the, you know, the the, the rest of the establishment links arms and you know, oh no, it's not happening. Unbelievable, you know. And there, but there's a fellow here, Jerry Sadovich, telling it. They knew, they all knew exactly what was going on. Early doors, and then you've got like uh, Philip Schofield, haven't you? The other week, um, Hans Cameron. A list of Tory paedophiles. Should have seen. You saw the face on him. They don't have no time for Schofield. Blimey, he's just a dick, isn't he? You know, have you ever watched him? Sits there fawning over her, doesn't he? Who's that co host he does it with? She's nice, like, what's she, Holly something or other? She's nice, but he's sitting there fawning on It's sickening. You can't watch it. But anyway, I thought he went up in my estimation when he can sit there with this. Bullington Club bastard and give him a list of um, perverts in his ranks. What's the first thing Cameron says? Hey, well, we don't want some sort of witch hunt because, you know, people are, these are homosexuals. What's that got to do with anything? So what's he doing? Linking automatically. If you're a homosexual, you're also a paedophile. In their circles, the two go hand in hand. Because it's not about love between two people with these fuckers, with Mandelson. And Harriet Harman, you know, who tried to bring in legislation to lower the age of consent to 16 when you don't know your ass from your elbow. You can't even vote yet. You can't even have a drink, but you can get bummed by these fuckers. Harriet Harman, I'll tell you what. But it's, you know, he's had to apologise. Apologise? I got my foot right off. Apologise. He's in a position, Schofield, if you have anything about him, people will listen to him. He said, I'm not apologising to these bastards, fiddling with kids and everything. It's the time we took a stand. I'm Philip Schofield. I'm taking a stand. I'm drawing a line in the sand. What does he do? I'm sorry. Because he's not thought it through, has he? Because he's another one that's just come through the ranks to get where he is. And you don't get to be, you know, the top echelons of television or media or politics. You don't get to go there unless you play the game to a certain extent. God knows what Philip Schofield's done in the past. I couldn't care less, to be honest, as long as he's not fiddling with kids. So he's been, at best, he's been a bit naive. But we all know I've got some, you know, I got got a bit of criticism left for the last show for, you know, attacking uh, all these politicians and stuff, saying, you know, I should really, I should really bite my tongue a bit because, you know, some of them might be innocent. Fuck them. No smoke without fire, as far as I'm concerned. If kids have been fiddled with these bastards, I couldn't care less. Do your worst. You're all pissing in the same pot anyway. Even if you're not actually kick, fiddling with these kids, you know about it. You, you're hiding it. You're capitulating in the whole sick saga. So for me, you know, you're fair game whether you've done it or not. You're part of that cabal. And that's what Truth Radio is about. That's what the Truth Movement's about. Exposing these fuckers. Couldn't care less what your political cue is. Tory, Liberal, Labour, they're all pissing in the same pot and they're all doing the same filthy, perverted crap. Cyril Smith, he was another one, wasn't he? A fat bastard. Hey, it's coming out now about him. Oh, he's an independent thinker, is Cyril Smith. Ah, of course he is. You know, but who, who forced him to apologise then, Schofield? Who's, who, who actually in those ranks has turned around to Schofield and says, you better apologise, mate? Top echelons at ITV? Have they turned around and said that to him? So they're playing the game then, aren't they? 
We all know we all know that this system is full of it's full of them, isn't it? Crooks, paedophiles, perverts. It's been we've known it for years. This isn't new to the likes of us. We've known about this for years. The stuff that was on. And we've been like lone voices in the wind, haven't we? It's all, you know. Ignore them, they're just conspiracy nutters. That's what we are, aren't we? Conspiracy nutters when we're saying things about this by your sceptics on the internet or, you know, in general. We're conspiracy nutters, but it's only the likes of us that are talking about it. And this is what pisses me off, and I keep harking on about it. It's what pisses me off about the so-called, you know, radical left. And I'm not on about the Labour Party. I'm not about people normally. I, I've got quite a lot of respect for thinking people, of you know, but on the far left, they ignore this sort of thing as well. Because to them, it's all about equality and it's all about freedoms and... And, you know, if, if someone is attracted to children or is a, homo, or a homosexual and they like kids, you know, that's their freedom, isn't it? Do what thou wilt, as Crowley said. Capitulators. All you've done is prolong this system, prolonged its downfall. Have no time for you. Wake up to it. Join us. Otherwise, fuck off and get out of the way. I've been finding out some stuff to tell you. One of the first attack dogs I noticed on Schofield was that Richard Littlejohn. You know, he's like this typical son type, isn't he? You know, one of their people. Right-wing Tory type. To, you know, immigrants coming in, nicking your jobs, your women, your houses, you know. But uh, we want to bring them in because we want to, you know, break the unions, we want to lower wages. Hate them types, but he's the first one. He lives in a big house in a uh, gated community in Florida, apparently. It's, uh, little John now. But he said then, Little John, first words out of his mouth, it's just some, it's just conspiracy theories, crazy conspiracy theories. They use that, love using that term, don't they, to attack us on all fronts. Any truth that we're exposing, from false flag terror to the banking system to these paedophiles in control, it's crazy conspiracy nuts. We're coming for you. We're coming for you. We're organising and we're going to get you, I tell you. But, um, yeah, here's a bit more. Been digging on these bastards. And some of the names that are coming out now. And tell you what, if you're listening, if you're doing your, uh, you know, retrospective listening to shows like this, where we're naming and shaming, trying to keep us so that we don't, we're not talking about these things, do your worst. Lord Gravel... Gren Gravel, Gravel, Shanna. Um, Gravel. Is that his name? Gravel? Gravel? Labour peer, anyway. Accused of raping a 14, 15-year-old boy at a holiday in Glasgow. Uh, the, night, the, the night before the boy was due to give evidence, the judge was taken out to dinner by the defence team for Jenna, and it was arranged that the boy was not allowed to be in court. Uh, Jenna wasn't supposed to be in court as his rapist, or he would be in contempt of court. What's that about? The boy wasn't, sorry, the boy wasn't allowed in court as he, you know, when, Jay, when Jenna was in there or he'd be in contempt of court. He's been raped, but because he's a 15-year-old boy. And he won his case, didn't he? And he, apparently, he, afterwards, he walks into the House of Commons after being accused of raping a 15-year-old boy and he got a standing ovation. At best, these people would keep, you know, you know, sit down and say nothing, hang their heads in shame that they've got to sit next to this pervert. Oh, he gets a round of applause. Kaufman, Lord Kaufman, Labour peer. Again, well known to police in this area. So apparently, he's, a, he's RMP for Gorton in Manchester. He's known to police in London for sexually abusing young boys. Likes them under 12 when he can get them. Kaufman. Then you've got Leon Britton. Remember him? Tory under Thatcher. Well known for raping young boys. Police raided his house when a young boy staggered into the street half naked. And when police asked him what happened, he told them that Britton and his friends had took, them to, took, took him to a house... And when they called, apparently when the police called in to report what happened, they were ordered to take everyone in. And uh, when they got there, two security officers were waiting. The boys were paid off, and a short time later, Leon Britton 
was summoned to a meeting of his fellow MP, William Haig. Nothing else heard. Later on, he's made uh, a commissioner for the UK. Pat on the back. Hey. Raping young lads, covered up, and then given a promotion. Unbelievable. Lord, uh, it's like Leon Britton. Remember him from years ago. What a slimy, horrible bastard he was. Spitting images to a belted take on him. Horrible. I said they told you about this fellow last time. Blair, didn't we? His background. Already mentioned what he got up to. Him petuning in public toilets in the early 80s. Hey. Try, <laughs> try to get sexual favours from another bloke in a bog. Turned out to be police, didn't it? Find 500 quid, walks away with nobody knowing. Apparently he used his middle names to cover who he really was. Charles Linton he used. Unbelievable, got off with a fine. Nothing, when's that ever been mentioned? When have you ever seen that in the press? This murdering bastard, Blair. The blood he's got on his hands, that fella. Murdering pervert bastard. Him and his horrible missus. Edward Heath, dead now. Dirty bastard, another one. Well known, apparently, in circles for the abuse of young boys. Jimmy Savile used to get the kids for him, apparently. Going on his yacht, procuring, procuring the kids, taking them on his yacht, on Ted Heath's yacht. How could he afford a yacht? Ted Heath, on a Prime Minister's wages. And I'll tell you why he could afford it, because he'd sold this country down the river, didn't he? He took the backhanders to get us into Europe. Heath was uh, in power when uh, they had the first referendum, you know, which took us into a common market. Not the Euro federal super state, you know, a common market of trade. On a bleeding yacht. Unbelievable. Uh, Lord Robertson, he's a jock, isn't he? Uh, former head of NATO, well another one, well known to the police. I removed from his job uh, by the government, US Yanks apparently, because they found out about his uh, tastes. They were going to expose him if he didn't resign, so they're saying. Uh, and then we got the, uh, oh, I'm resigning for family reasons. Dangerous, predatory, jock, paedophile, bastard. Uh, Lord Hardy. Uh, the former Lord Advocate for Scotland, well-known paedophile. Uh, apparently, uh, he had two victims, well-known paedophile, he had two victims. Uh, they stole his car after he'd done whatever to him. When they were caught, apparently uh, Lord Hardy told the police to uh, let him go. Didn't want charges brought against them. So you why, because he'd been buggering him before. The, uh, Unbelievable. So what? Uh, it's making me feel sick. But I could go on. But so uh, what? We'll have another song and uh, we'll see if I uh, can stomach any more of this because it's, honestly, it's genuinely making me sick. Let's have a look. Critical Mass Radio is a completely non-profit station where the hosts pay to broadcast their shows. The mission of the station is to get as much information as possible out to people about the world we live in, to unite like-minded people and to try to come up with workable solutions. If you agree with the work that we are doing, then please feel free to help us continue by making a donation on the webpage. CMR is for people who want answers, because now it is our turn. Yeah, it is sickening, but um, we've got to expose him, haven't we? And, you know, we've got to tell the truth. Another one there, McAlpine, he's the latest one, isn't he? Like I was mentioning earlier on. 
bought off the fella, you know, his accuser. You can tell, obviously. Well, he's known to the police in the UK and abroad, sexually abusing young boys, including using a coffin to put the little boy in, and then they simulate burying him by sprinkling gravel on top of the coffin. Apparently the little kid's screaming in terror and do whatever, he, do whatever he's told, so he's so scared of being put in the coffin again so they can rape him and whatever. Straight from, you know, the monarch mind control this, isn't it, that all the kids in America have to go through, you know? All these Disney kids. And this McAlp and this per Dave, I remember David Icke exposing this bleeder years ago and just threatening him, saying, come on, do your worst then. This is the truth about you. You know, never done it, has he? But it's all coming out now with his sixth. You know, alleged to have murdered at least two boys and buried their bodies on his estate. And this information came from a police officer. It's not just come out of the ether. Who was involved in investigating McAlpine. And he's certain that he's committed murder several times, but he's too, the two, he's too well protected. He's been named time and time again in, in all these child abuse inquiries. You know, but he's just got away, hasn't he? Just walks away because he's fat, wants a cash, and he's been free to abuse. And, and this is just the stuff that we're getting, you know, about putting a little, a little lad out in a coffin. Imagine the terror you'd feel if you were five or six year old, being put in a coffin in there, putting the lid down and pretending to bury him alive. Five and six year old. Apparently, you know, just the biggest belief. I mean, there's a video apparently hidden at the moment, but guaranteed it'll come out, guaranteed it'll come out, which shows McAlpine and apparently two other high-profile sexual abusers torturing and raping young boys, made in Wales apparently. It's well known to an investigative programme. They had a copy, they were loaned a copy, so that the story you know, could be revealed, the kids could get some justice. But they never went with it. Powers again at the top. No, you're not doing that. It's not in the public interest. It's not in their bleeding interest. Apparently, when women watched, one of the women uh, on the production company watched it and admitted she had to leave the room to be sick after a couple of minutes. There's loads known about this fella that's going to come out. You know, there's some of it on the internet. I'll leave it to you if you want to go and have a look. But it's all there. Another one, another top high profile Tory. Always, I always knew he was bent off. Well, he was homosexual anyway. Michael Patillo, you know, another darling of the media, always on the politics program, wasn't he? And that one with um, um, Andrew Neil used to get late at night. The voice of reason in the Conservative Party, well known within the Conservative uh, Party as uh, an abuser of children. Apparently, likes adults now and again because um, he's homosexual. Apparently. Uh, Head follower Peter Lilly, another one. Likes to go on holiday to Morocco, where he delights in having young boys for sexual abuse. Hey, he likes to go to the same hotel on every visit. Apparently, left some uh, top secret documents behind in the UK uh, in re relation to the UK's defence systems. I mean, was that an accident? Was he being blackmailed? Who knows? Apparently he goes, he goes on to the Isle of Wight regularly with uh, Lily and other friends where they have access to children. David Icke will know all about that. You know, another one. Oh, that we're supposed to pat on the back and wave into the sunset. Oh, we forgive you. Like, fuck. Hey. Every little five and six year old little boy and girl that these bleeders have had their way with. You think you're walking away? No chance. Scallywag magazine apparently did it's defunct now, don't go anymore. I remember reading it years ago. Uh, they did um they covered events at uh, in Wales, you know, with the child abuse scandals. And um they named McAlpine at the time. Derek Lord, another one. And he, and another high rolling Tory. All named years ago. By an independent magazine, like I say, closed now. Mainstream media never took it up. Lord, don't even you know this fella, he's a black fella, top Tory, you know, they always wheel him out at conferences and all that. Look how multicultural we are, you know. 
still a dirty bastard. You know, they might wheel him out as, you know, the, the, the decent face of the Conservatives, you know, we're not the nasty Conservatives. Look, we've got this black fella here, high rolling Tory, dirty, child abusing bastard. Couldn't give a toss what colour you are, mate, you're still filth. It just goes on. I've got a list here as long as you're arm. And I could just sit here all night listing these bastards. Lord Montague, Be Bole, another one, Bole. Another dirty bastard. Gordon Brown, mentioned him last time. Brown is known for sexually abusing numerous boys as well as little girls. He's known for a particularly vile rape in Aberdeen in the 70s when he and two other paid a prostitute for access to her nine-year-old daughter. They all raped her several times. You know, apparently a few years later, that little girl that they'd raped went to court to get custody of her little brother because she was so frightened of what her mother, who was like a drug user, probably, you know, like I say, a prostitute, what she, you know, who she'd farm him out to. But the thing is, she won the case. You know, she's had custody of him ever since. Records have disappeared. Imagine that, having that bastard in his ill, raping a little, <sighs> sometimes it can, you know, you, you can be spout, coming out with this stuff and, you know, the, the, you feel this need for retribution, you feel this need to get back at these bastards. And yeah, sometimes it can come across as bloodlust and sometimes it can come across as, you know, a bit jingoistic a bit gung-ho, oh, we should sit back, you know, and meditate on these things, and it'll all come out in the world. Fuck off! I won't keep, I'll keep saying it. I don't care how much of this hippie crap you keep coming out with. These bleeders are going to pay. For every little boy and every little girl they've abused and raped and lives they've ruined and murdered and buried in their grounds and their blood rituals and their... They're going to pay. They're going to pay. Right. Um, I'll tell you what. Um, what time, how much time we got left? Don't, I was going to say, don't time fly when you're enjoying yourself. But I am particularly enjoying myself tonight because this is just stuff that's got to get out there. And it's not easy listening, is it? And it's even less easy for the likes of me, who does like a bit of a laugh, you know. It's not always like this. I do like to lighten things up a bit. But it's not easy having to talk about these things. These things and it does need saying. And I hope you know, in the not too distant future, um, people can listen back to this and say, blimey, they were right, the truth movement. We didn't listen at the time. You know, seemed too far fetched. But, you know, I hope it does get back to them. I really do. All these that have been named tonight, I hope it does get back to them. Do your worst. Hey, do your worst. The line's been drawn in the sand. Do your worst. Right, tell you what. Um, what else have I got now? I've got uh, a couple more things that have been getting right on my nerves. Not maybe not as much as depressing as that. So um, something we can all, uh, you know, mull over, and um, we're not putting it behind us, are we? Because this is on the forefront of what we're fighting for. This is the reality of what we're fighting. Sometimes we can get lost, can't we, in this sort of mystical new world order and this mystical Illuminati, and they, they seem so out of our reach that you know we, we can lose track of what we're actually fighting against but this is a reality of what we're fighting against this is in our faces this is our children this is our friends our neighbors our people peoples of the world that are being systematically raped abused pillaged ravaged and you think we're getting it bad now, what they've got planned for us over the next couple of years, if we get through the next couple of years, is so nightmarish that it doesn't bear thinking about. And if we do not pull our fingers out, and if we do not draw that line in the sand, and if we do not go on the offensive, and we do not start to bring these fuckers down, then we deserve everything we get, and we should hang our heads in shame for these little girls and these little boys. See it after this, chaps. Yeah, that was live. Blimey, she got some lungs on her, hasn't she? Old uh, Ruthie Hensall from um, singing in Les Miserables, you know, about the French Revolution. But, um, you know, there's true talent for you, isn't it?
somebody can get onto on stage and sing like that live and put that sort of emotion into a song, you know, pitch perfect, brilliant. Imagine Lady Gaga or that poor of Babylon Madonna doing anything even close to that without the mixing desk behind them and the back masking and the rest of their shite that they have. Hey, that's, you know, it's not exactly my type of music, you know, but I can appreciate real talent and that's what that girl's got. Right, um, yeah, we'll move on. But that's a difficult subject I've just got through, but it's not the end of it, not by a long chalk, and there's got to be a lot more coming in, out, isn't there? You know, they'll start turning on each other, as in what, you know, they'll break ranks, and, the, you know, this house of cards, hopefully, will start to fall, won't it? And it might just be that spark that we need to get the sheeple up and doing stuff. Who knows? Um, another thing that passed us by, didn't it? The um, 5th of November. Guy Fawkes night, bonfire night, you know, which to most people, most people don't even know the history of it, do they? Bonfire night. It's just an excuse to let off bangers and frighten the cats and, you know, get a bomby going. <laughs> no, that's most of them. You know, what's it actually about? Haven't got a clue, you know. We had it drummed into us when I was at school. Um, remember, remember, the 5th of November, uh, November, gunpowder, treason and plot. I see no reason why the gunpowder treason should ever be forgot. Treason, my ass. He was a hero, Guy Fawkes. The last great Englishman, in my opinion. But, um, yeah, 5th of November, when... Um, Guy Fawkes and the cons co-conspirators, you know, you know, blow up the houses of Parliament. You all know the story, don't you? Obviously, it's because it's where the um, film V for Den Vendetta got its inspiration, didn't it? Which has led on to the um, the mask of uh, Guy Fawkes for Anonymous. Um, yeah, there might be a bit of manipulation in the background. Um, but for me, V for Vendetta is probably one of the most revolutionary films ever made, isn't it? that seem to slip through, you know, under the radar of the powers that be. Because it is, it is, that's been inspirational, hasn't it, to a lot of people. Sort of spark them on, the, like, much like the, the Matrix film, sort of, um, even though that contains so much <laughs> hidden symbolism that it's frightening. Um, and uh, I'd advise any of you listening who want a little further into the, the background to the Matrix, uh, do a search on a fella called Freeman, in America, and he's done some fantastic stuff on the uh, background to the film The Matrix. Um, Wachowski Brothers, who did that, who, apparently they're the same fellas that did Viva for De Vendetta. So either they're on our side trying to get information out, or they're part of the system, you know, pulling the strings and uh, leading us in a certain way. That's uh, for you to decide and for, you know, to make your own mind up about. But on the face of it, it's. Uh, it's, it's, it appears, anyway, to have got people doing stuff, which, you know, can't be a bad thing, can it? But it's, um, yeah, it just it annoys me that um, people then had a passion about them, didn't they? That they were willing to sacrifice their lives for something they believed in. Yeah, it was about religion, wasn't it? You know, they were Catholics and they were trying to stop, you know, Catholic persecution and and fair enough, you know, that's what they, was going on without any shadow of a doubt, you know, so for these people, and forget people forget that the conspirators were all sort of landed gentry, you know, they weren't just ordinary people, they, they had stuff to lose, but their beliefs uh, that something had to change and they had to take the actions they did and get off of their ass and do something, whether we agree with what they did or the actions they took is by the by, it doesn't really matter, does it? We can st I can still find admiration for people that have got that much spirit and a belief that things are wrong and, and, and you know, things have got to change. A bit of fears. I mean, to, there's a lot of uh, thinking at the minute that uh, people have looked into the gunpowder plot, the false flag, false flag. One of the first examples of false flag terror, that it was set up, you know, after it was all over and done when they'd stopped the plot to blow up the Houses of Parliament. Within minutes, it was all over the pulpits of the church, Protestant church, obviously. And the Catholics went through unbelievable persecution after that. And that's, you know, if you're this, um, at the time, Protestant power elite in this country, and exactly what you want. 
if you want to round up Catholics, if you want to burn Catholics and people that want to introduce a different uh, religious doctrine into the into a country like Britain, have that, you know. I mean, we can see above this, obviously, but you've got to look at things at the time. And it, yeah, of course, it would make sense to create a false flag terror attack that's been stopped by the security services of the time. And then you get exactly what you want because you get the, this uh, uh, this threat from the Catholics. It's just in all, isn't it? Because you wake up, you, you get the sheeple, the Protestant sheeple at the time, turning on your Catholic neighbours. First example of false flag terror, possibly. Who's, who, you know, who's to know? But that's an aside, um, something to think about anyway. But yeah, it just gets on my nerves that people don't, they're not, they're not even aware of it. And um, it's a major part of our history, the gunpowder plot. I'm on the face of it, like I say, I admire uh, if it wasn't <laughs> a false flag terror attack. If it wasn't, it, I admire the fact that uh, people were willing to get off their asses against, you know, insurmountable odds and take action, which is, you know, perhaps we're the descendants of those people. Same people who were at Peterloo, same people that, you know, initiated the gunpowder plot. People that got off their asses and did stuff. We're, you know, we're the descendants of those people. I feel their DNA. Um, another thing, well, how much time we got? Oh, we've got next to no time left. But, um, yeah, just going back to, you know, what's happening with the European super state. Um, some stuff coming out now, documents being released. Um, we can see how it all came together. And, you know, the lies that they told us from very early doors about what, the, you know, what, uh, Europe was about how people were conned in Europe into believing it. And, you know, they're starting to break ranks. We've got this uh, Vladimir Bukowski, who was um, a Soviet dissident. Um, he was allowed to study secret Soviet documents in 1992 uh, by Boris Yeltsin, who needed his support at the time. And uh, Bukowski uh, just told the Brussels Journal about a plan to make the EU like the Soviet Union. And this was in uh, documents in 1992. It says uh, in, uh, from these documents in uh, January of 1989, a delegation of the Tri Trilateral Commission came to see Gorbachev. It included uh, the former Japanese Prime Minister, Yashiro, uh, the former French, French President, Jisad Distan, American banker David Rockefeller, um, Kissinger, and they uh, had a very nice conversation, apparently, where they tried to explain to Gorbachev that Soviet Russia had to integrate into the financial institutions of the world, such as GATT, the IMF, and the World Bank. And in the middle of this uh, discourse, Jistar Dissan suddenly takes the floor and says, Mr. President, I cannot tell you exactly when it will happen, probably within 15 years, but Europe is going to be a federal state, and you have to prepare yourself for that. You have to work with us and the European leaders. This was in 1992, uh, 1999, I should say. The powers that be telling the Russians, who had recently, you know, uh, apparently gotten rid of the shackles of communism. Sorry, in this country, didn't we? With, like I say, with that pervert Heath in the, the early days, you know, our entry into the EU, underhand schemes by secret politicians, deceived Parliament and the people with lies and deceit into thinking we were only joining, joining a trading agreement when these bastards really knew what the aim was. It was political union, wasn't it? Federal super state. Our membership of the EU, planning this years ago, billions of pounds of taxpayers' money we have to give to the EU with no, you know, no legit legitimacy. Breaking, you know, all... Well, it's all about breaking down national boundaries, wasn't it? Or any sort of national ideas of national sovereignty. And if you've got this plan, which they've had, you know, from donkey's years back, they do it by stepping stones, don't they? And this was just one stepping stone. They sold it to us as a, you know, a market where we'll all benefit in a free open trade market, which on the face of it sounds like a reasonable thing. And you can see why people voted for it, even though apparently the Yes campaign had millions the no campaign had about a million quid. But yeah, on the face of it, it does seem reasonable, doesn't it? And, you know, in, if you're not particularly enlightened along these uh, financial lines, that we should uh, be able to trade without restriction. 
Uh, some documents have been released now of minutes of meetings between uh, Teddy, filthy pervert, French President George Pompidou in 1971. Uh, the meetings were held in secret, and minutes were classified until uh, Thatcher was able to release them under the Freedom of Information Act in 2008-2009. Funny thing with Thatcher, isn't it? It's on... <laughs> Horrible bitch, dance on a grave, or piss on a grave. No, neither. But, you know, every now and then she seemed to do stuff, didn't she, that you think, why? What's up? What? She's obviously rattling their cages. She's obviously not towing the line totally. You know, the lady's not paternity, no, and all this carry on. And obviously they got rid of her, didn't they? But uh, it makes you wonder that there might just be the odd politician that they've not got the um, the filth on. They've played the game, you know, but they've not abused kids and they've not raped and, you know, hated Thatcher with the venues what she did to this country and the people. But perhaps, just perhaps, she wasn't one of those that, you know, was part of these sick rituals and bloodletting and killing of kids, etc. Who knows? But like I say, they got rid of it, didn't they? Uh, documents prove um, how the uh, most powerful European late leaders laid the foundations in Europe for multiculturalism and the Islamification of Western Europe. Um, and they did everything they could to prevent the peoples of Europe and Britain from learning the truth about this conspiracy for 40 years. Now, they've always, now it's, it's, it is difficult, I, I, I'm the first to admit it's difficult to talk about these subjects because you're automatic, you've got, you'll automatically get this knee-jerk reaction when you talk about multiculturalism, when you talk about racism, when you talk about um, different ethnic groups or whatever. You, you'll get this knee-jerk reaction. You shouldn't talk about that because it's racist. But if you put the powers that be are pulling the strings and creating societies, uh, like uh, multicultural societies in Europe, in Britain, and telling us that uh, these things have just happened you know, by chance, or uh, economics has dictated that they've happened, or um, it's helping uh, countries of the, of the third world by uh, taking their brightest and best and bringing them in to our nations and, to, and selling it as, as a good thing without actually having a mandate to do it, and then documentation is released which shows it was it was something they pre-planned. So, believe right we can talk about it. Believe right we can expose them for doing it. That doesn't mean that doesn't mean we hate anybody by talking about it. That doesn't mean that I, I'm saying right, all back on the boat, chaps. These bleeders brought you in. You're going home. Far from it. I'm not saying anything like that. I'm saying, come on, people, wake up, everyone of different religions, hues, colours, whatever. We're being manipulated by these bastards, and here's the proof of it. So all you trendy lefties and all you conservative right types who've got this, you know, who are listening in, if you do listen in in the future or whatever, wake the fuck up campaigning against racism, imperialism, fair enough, but point the finger at the right people. Right, um, yeah. Why, the Islamification of Europe, what's that about? It, you know, it works on uh, so many levels. I mean, there's a divide and conquer thing straight off, isn't there? If you, if you want to get rid of the religions of Europe to bring in a global religion, first of all, you've got to destroy the religion first, haven't you? So of course you want to bring in uh, this Muslim faith, which is no fre no friend of liberalism, is it, or the liberal West? No matter how they might, uh, you know, Sharia law, the reality of it, it's <laughs> it's no good to um, homosexuals, is it? Because you're not gonna, if, if you've got, ever got Sharia law in Europe or in this country, homosexuals be the, would be the first to go. Freedom of speech would be the first to go. Freedom of expression would be the first to go. Same-sex marriages, that'd be right out the window, wouldn't it? So all you, you know, so-called radicals, look who are pulling the strings. And we're, and we're muzzled, aren't we? We're, 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 we muzzle ourselves when we talk about these sort of things. We police ourselves. Don't say that. You can't say things like that. You'll upset such and such. Fuck off. Past all that. Past all that. You see, they, do, uh, they created um, a co-presidency between the, it's called the, uh, Brussels created the Barcelona process, it was called, a unification for the Mediterranean. 
Um, it, what it's meant was a co-presidency between the uh, EU and a Mediterranean Muslim country, chosen with consensus for a two-year term. And this is going back to 1974. They want to bring Turkey into the EU. Now, Turkey, uh, 70 million Turks have already, you know, in, a, in, when, in opinion polls in Turkey, they've worked out that 70, uh, on the day that Turkey was allowed to become part of the European Union, 70 million Turks would leave Turkey to come and live in Europe, which they'd be perfectly entitled to do. A lot of them are dead for places like Germany. Germany's got a massive Turkish population, but a hell of a lot would come here. Changing the face of European countries with that sort. You cannot have an influx of that many people of, you know, of that political persuasion and culture without fundamentally destroying the fabric of any nation or, or you know, culture. And the conflict and the turmoil that ar arise from that would suit these bastards down to the ground. And it's all there now. They're all these uh, doc secret documentation is all coming out now. And it's even coming out via people like Thatcher. So that's saying something, isn't it? Frightening. Frightening. Population, nine, you know, 70 million, yeah. And, um, and they're young, a lot of them. And they can't wait to leave. And you can just, that's exactly what they're talking about. Every time I turn, I turn on uh, RT or whatever, you know, they, whenever they're talking about Europe, it always seems to come up. We've got to let it's time Turkey came into the um, European Union. Purely on a, a militaristic level because uh, of the access to the Middle East via Turkey, you know, with their air bases, etc. The NATO. So it's worth having Turkey in the EU just on that basis. <laughs> the picture is so much bigger, people. So much bigger. Right, I'm running out of time. Um, a bit late tonight. Yeah, what time? We're nearly on there. Half 11. Most of you be ready for bed, won't you? Sat there now with your cocoa and your uh, digestive biscuits waiting for me to sod off. But uh, before I go, it was, it, like I say, we had the uh, sad thing with our friend Paul who decided to take his own life. And yeah, it was sad. But brother, hopefully we'll meet again and uh, we'll carry on the fight in your absence. So uh, don't forget, chaps, if you want to get in touch in the meantime, I'll try and uh, make sure I uh, become a bit more regular on their CMR, if only to annoy certain elements. <laughs> Not everyone. But, uh, yeah, I look forward to uh, seeing you next week. Uh, this is for you, Paul, and um, I'll see you chaps next week, hopefully. Thanks a lot.